fester like a sore, and then run. Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a circus sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Come on, Johnson, I'm out, and there's still hot water. Hey, booktube, it's Angie. I have another um, book to movie, uh, reading the movie video to do. This one's a little bit different, maybe, because it started out as a play, but it's since had uh, movie translations to it, so I figured I would talk about it anyway. And it fits into Black History Month because it's a pretty important play to talk about um, when you talk about Black History. And that is A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. A little bit about Lorraine Hansberry first. She was a um, playwright that grew up in the uh, south side of Chicago in the 1950s or maybe earlier, I forget exactly when she was born, but in that sort of era. Her parents were activists. She grew up in an area where um, I think I read that her family was actually one of the first black families to integrate into a white neighborhood in Chicago uh, in that time. And when you get into the story of the Raisin, A Raisin in the Sun, you see that that kind of plays into uh, one of the key storylines in, in the play. But the thing about the play, I thought I would mention that uh, is kind of cool, is uh, uh, in 1959, when this was first produced for the stage, uh, it had pretty instant success and uh, at the end of the year it ended up winning the best play of the year by the um, New York Drama Critics Group and then further uh, Hansberry herself went on to win a bunch of awards. Um, she was awarded um, I'm just trying to remember the name of the award. She was awarded the New York Critics Circle Award for this play and uh, at that time, she became uh, the youngest American to ever win it, the first black playwright to ever win it, and the fifth person in history to ever be given this award. And she was only 29 years old. So <laughs> another one of those stories if, you know, you're in your mid-20s or later and you're trying to think, oh, I haven't done anything amazing with my life, which is a feeling I run into a lot. <laughs> um, just think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a little bit of a sad note to put on the end of that is that a few years later in 1965, uh, Lorraine developed cancer and passed away at the age of, of 34, but still an impressive feat. And had she not developed cancer, can you imagine what more amazing writing we would have gotten out of her? The story itself, I'm trying not to sidetrack too much, the story itself has to do with younger, the younger family uh, who is living in this sort of like rundown, um, <sighs> I was going to use the word squalor, but I didn't know if that was too strong, but because it's, it's not like, it's not necessarily like tenement housing, but it's, it's a rundown apartment complex in Southside Chicago. And uh, they're all working, um, you know, uh, entry-level blue-collar jobs to, to get the bills paid. But they all have individual dreams of uh, wanting to better their situation. And it's this whole family living together. It's the mother, Lena, her son and his wife, uh, Walter and 
Ruth and their son Travis and also Walter's younger sister uh, Benita and they're all in this little apartment building and it's one of those uh, old time apartment buildings where you have like a communal bathroom so there's uh, scenes where everybody's trying to fight with other neighbors in the building to try to make it happen and just there the bulk of the story is just these conversations this family has of um having these dreams and and wanting to um better their situation but also having self-doubts and not knowing if they can pull it off or you know if if the world will allow dreams to happen for them so we meet these these individual characters uh lena she's um just getting out of housekeeping work. I think she's like a housekeeper or nanny combination situation uh, with one wealthy family. And uh, she is finally retiring. She Her husband had passed away recently and she's getting a insurance check as, you know, like a life insurance benefit check. And it's supposed to be a sizable check uh, for for the 1950s and all the family is really excited about it and they all have <laughs> opinions about what she should do with the money but of course it's it's her money it's what her husband had left for her but um she, you know at the end of the day she is a mom so she is thinking about her kids so she has plans to put little bits aside for everybody but her main thing she wants is she wants to get the family out of this cramped apartment so she goes looking for houses and uh, she looks through all the ones in the black neighborhoods and she said for the money they're asking those places are dumps so she goes and looks into uh, white neighborhoods where there are houses available and she comes upon uh, this place I think it's called Claiborne Park I think that was the name of it, where uh, she finds a house that's in the right price range for her. It's a good size for everybody, and she buys it. And then she runs into uh, this wall that calls itself the Welcoming Committee. It's this one guy that comes in and represents the whole neighborhood and basically tells her, uh, well, you know, we heard about your family coming in, and... It's just the, the neighborhood kind of took a vote and it's just that we really like to have neighbors who come from similar backgrounds in the neighborhood. And he goes through this whole thing of finding a million ways to say they don't want black people in the neighborhood. Uh, so that that is a big scene in the play. Additionally, you also have Benita who is uh, developing a lot of pride in her African-American heritage and she wants to learn about... Um, the native languages of Africa and she's studying college she wants to become a doctor she hopes to you know take up a position somewhere where it's really gonna make a difference in the world and uh, her friend and uh, language teacher uh, Joseph as a guy he becomes very important to her and there's a, a bit of a romance that develops there but there's also some tension between them because uh, as a guy teases her about becoming a assimilationist where he said you know you you know you're just worried about fitting in and all of that, and this is all you know a, a facade and you know you're ba basically jokingly calls her a poser which really gets under her skin but other than that she really loves him or develops a love for him over the the course of the play Randolph Hall Friday night you're with me What's your idea of asking for a date, George? It's more than a date if I'm asking. Well, I have to get back to you. Do so. But tarry not. There are legions of honeys who would have your place. Goodbye, George. I've got class. Isowopo, la fin dadba. Isowopo, la fin dadba. Isowopo, la fin koli. Isowopo, la fin koli. Relax, it's coming. <sighs> oh no, no, boom. Oh do no, yara, osife. Osife. Very good. <sighs> well, all my students like you, I would be an even happier man. I don't need false flattery, Asagai. I do quite well with the truth. Well then, um, I guess I shall tell you the truth. You are not very good. You are 
gyerek felett. <laughs> you really think so? Yes. I am happy with you. I... I would be even happier if I could take you out on one of your dates. A date? Isn't that what you call it here when a man and woman go out and spend time together? Well, yes, but... Okay, before you crush my spirit and ego, I will withdraw the offer. Uh, maybe your phone number will not be so precious. Well, I, I suppose a phone number can't hurt. important to me there's that whole thing going on and then we have Walter who is the main guy in the story Walter is you know with in the absence of his father he's obviously taken the man of the house position and Walter works as a chauffeur for rich white families his wife Ruth does uh, housekeeping I think or cooking I forget. Um, again, some sort of blue collar work. And then they have their son, Travis. And one of the key um, themes that, that gets talked about in this play is Walter's sort of dreamer side and his uh, weakness for get rich quick schemes. And his, his heart is in a good place. He just wants good things for his family and he feels limited um, with opportunities in life so he just goes for whatever opportunities do come up it's just that a lot of those opportunities don't pan out um, the way he wants them to but hang it he keeps trying at it uh, and he's just determined to find something that is going to work but his wife Ruth is she's very frazzled with him she's very over all of these schemes because she's been with him for years now and she's always like, you know, nothing ever comes of this. We just lose money and then you get depressed and it's just this cycle that keeps starting over and and she's just sort of done with it all. Um, she just wants something secure and stable for her son to grow up in. And, and Ruth is sort of um, the, I don't know the word I'm looking for. She's sort of... Uh, has, she sort of has a straightforward approach to things in that um, she's kind of like, you know, of course I want better things. Of course I had big dreams, but, you know, if I have to work these jobs in order to provide for my son, that's what I'm going to do because that's what I can rely on. And her, her husband, Walter, is always like, no, we got to dream bigger. It's small, right, Mommy? Yes, it does, Travis. It's too early in the morning to be talking about money, so just eat your breakfast. But I need 50 cents. For what? For the poor Negroes in history. For the what? Titi says we gotta do something about teaching color kids about their history. Their history. And what's that got to do with 50 cents and poor Negroes? All those kids are putting in 50 cents to buy special books that tell us about the things the poor Negroes did. Is that the way your teacher put it? The poor Negroes? Yes, ma'am. That's the way she always puts it. And they need 50 cents for special books for the poor Negroes. Yes, mama. That's what I said. I don't have it. But I don't want to be the only one without the money, Mom. I said I don't have it, Travis. Just eat your breakfast. I'm finished. Go on and make up your bed. I know that woman wants me to kiss her goodbye, but I'll fix her. I won't kiss her goodbye, and she'll be sorry. I won't kiss her goodbye for nothing in this world, because I know that's just what she wants me to do. Mom. Can I please bag groceries? Can I, Mommy? What does he want to do? Bag groceries after school. For the poor Negroes and his Travis. No. Who's raising money for something? I gotta have 50 cents. Why don't you give it to me? Because we don't have it. What you gonna tell me the boy things like that for? Man, 
Travis. Thanks, Daddy. In fact, there's another 50 cents. You should go buy yourself some fruit or take a taxi cab to school or something. Hot dog! Thanks, Daddy. I'm going to school now. Don't be late. That's my boy. One of the things that plays one of the that becomes one of the tension points in the play is uh, Walter gets word of this um, business proposition, and he needs his wife to sort of sweet talk his mom into uh, giving over some of the insurance money so that he can put a down payment on this business startup. And his wife doesn't like that idea. She was just like, "Oh, here we go again." But he's like, oh, no, no, she'll listen to you. You know, she, she's, she's suspicious of me. Um, but maybe if you talk to her, you know, you have one of your, you know, mother-daughter kind of talks or whatever. You get real sweet with her. Um, just get, you know, make, make it sound like a good idea. All of these different uh, character stories sort of come together and explode in the, the final part of the play. And the amazing thing about this story is that, I mean, it is known as a classic of African American literature, but it's not exclusive to that. Uh, anybody can watch this, this play, read this story, and you're gonna see things you can relate to. Yes, there are elements that are specifically directed towards African American culture, but a lot of the uh, trials that this family goes through, at least on some level, anybody can relate to them. You know, with Walter wants more respect from his from his boss at work, and Benito wants her interests and her you know educational goals and things like that to be taken seriously. And <laughs> Ruth wants her husband to be not so much of a dreamer and a flake. <laughs> and oh, and um. Lena just wants her kids to treat each other better and, and love one another and um, stop all these money-wasting schemes and all that. And they, it's all like universal storylines that, that all of our families have gone through. And I think that was a powerful thing that Hansberry pulled off in bringing this play out where uh, we could see a snapshot of something maybe we weren't familiar with or weren't aware of but at the same time, you still get the message that you know, we all have this similarity that, you know, can bring the wall down between us, which I think is pretty damn cool. That's why I said it, it's a real bummer <laughs> that um, she developed cancer and, and we lost so much of what was maybe in her to, to, to still bring forward. Uh, so I was putting off this, this video a little bit because... Uh, I mean, I'd been planning to do it for a while, but I was putting it off because I wanted to see the different um, versions of of the show. When it went to stage in 1959, it originally starred Sidney Poitier in the Walter role. And uh, I, uh, before I uh, picked this book up a while back, I hadn't actually watched any of the shows in their entirety. I'd, of course, seen clips here and there. But uh, I wanted to go back and watch all of them and see what I thought. And, um, you know, I thought that the uh, the Sidney Portier portrayal would be a slam dunk for me because I'm a huge fan of his already. Uh, and it is good. <laughs> I have a little bit of a maybe unpopular opinion to share in a little bit. But uh, going through all these. So uh, Sidney Portier started the stage show. And then down the road... Uh, Danny Glover did an American Playhouse. I think it was American Playhouse. If I remember right, yeah. Uh, Danny Glover played the role in an American Playhouse production that uh, was aired on TV back in the 70s, I think. And then most recently, I think in 2008, it came out. Um, uh, Sean Combs, P. Diddy, Puff Daddy. I'm sorry, I can't remember which name he's going by now. You know what I'm talking about, P. Diddy. Uh, he, he came to screen, screen as Walter. 
And my unpopular opinion, probably, is that I liked Sean Combs' version the best. Um, you know, I know some people might be like, oh, okay, right, this rapper is like trying to be a serious actor now, but no, he did a damn fine job as as Walter. Uh, he he played Walter the closest to what I kind of had in my mind when I was reading it. Um, as <laughs> see, this is where I go more into the unpopular opinion. As much as I love Sidney Poitier, there were some scenes where uh, he just came at it a lot harder as Walter than kind of the way I read it um, in the play. Um, he he comes at him sometimes a lot angrier, um, like vocally, just a lot more aggressive than the way I read Walter. A lot of Walter's scenes, I mean, he does get mad in the story, but um, there was, it was sort of like, <sighs> When I read Walter, I read him a lot as like a quiet anger where he was sort of like keeping it deep down a lot of the time um, because, you know, he had kid around and he didn't want to like go off on his wife and all that. Uh, so it was like simmered down a lot. And um, Sean Combs brought a lot more of that sort of pushed down anger to it. And I mean, it's crazy to say, but I felt like Sean Combs brought a little more nuance to it um, compared to Sidney Poitier. And I know that's insane to say because it's Sidney fucking Poitier. <laughs> um, but just in this particular role, I mean, it's just, it's just the reality of it. I'm not saying that Sidney Poitier's was bad. He was amazing in his. I just, it's a personal preference thing. I think the, and it wasn't just uh, Sean Combs necessarily in his role. I think that 2008 production as a whole was was just really amazing and underrated um, because everybody is quick to say that Poitier was was the most amazing because of who he is. Charlie Atkins was a good for nothing loud mouth too, wasn't he? When he wanted me to go in the dry cleaning business with him. Now he's grossing a hundred thousand dollars a year. Hundred thousand dollars a year. Still call him a loud mouth good for nothing. Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter. You're tired, ain't you, baby? You oh so tired of everything. Me, the boy, the way we live in this beat up hole, everything. Moaning and groaning all the time, but you wouldn't do nothing to help, would you? I mean, you couldn't be on my side that long for nothing. Walter, good. please, leave me alone. Man needs a woman to back him up. You Walter. Know. Mama would listen to you, and you know she listens to you more than you do me and Benny. She thinks more of you. Look, all you got to do is sit down with her one morning when you're having your coffee and talking about things like you do. Just say kind of easy like that you've been thinking about this little deal Walter is so interested in about the store and all. Just keep sipping away at your coffee like what you're saying ain't that important to you. Before you know it, she's listening good and asking you questions. Then when I come home, I fill in the details. Please leave me alone. Okay, this ain't no fly-by-night operation. I mean, we got this thing figured out, me, Willie, and Bobo. Bobo? Huh. Look, we figured the initial investment on the place to be about $30,000. That's $10,000 a piece. Now, of course, we got to spread around a few hundred so as not to spend your life waiting for them clowns to let your license get approved. You mean graft? Don't call it that. Goes to show you how much women know about the world. Baby, don't nothing happen for you in this world unless somebody gets paid off. Walter, leave me alone. Eat your eggs, you're gonna be cold. See? The man say to his woman, I got me a dream. She says, eat your eggs, they're getting cold. The man say to his woman, help me now to take a hole in this world somehow. And she says, eat your eggs and go to work. I tell you, I gotta change my life because I'm choking to death. And all you say to me is eat these eggs. Walter, that ain't none of our money. I ain't gonna be harassing your mama about it. I'm looking in the mirror this morning, and I'm thinking I'm 35 years old, I'm married 11 years, and I got a boy who's got to sleep in the living room because I got nothing, eh? Nothing to give him but stories. Like on how rich white people live, eh? Eat your eggs, Walter. Damn these eggs. Damn all the eggs that ever was. And go to work. I'm trying to talk to you about me. Now, all you're going to say to me is eat these eggs? You never said nothing new. I listen to you every day, every morning, every night. You never said nothing new. So you'd rather be Mr. Armour than be a chauffeur. So 
I'd rather be living in Buckingham Palace. And that's just what's wrong with a colored woman in this world today. You don't understand about billing your men up, making them feel like they're somebody, like they can do something. There are colored men who do things. No thanks to the colored woman. Being a colored woman, I guess I can't help myself none. I know me cost seventy five thousand dollars to get into something like we're thinking about getting into, but will he know somebody that could get us in the building? That's ten thousand three ways, plus a little something extra to spread around to the people to get the licenses approved. What you mean bribes? Don't call it that. This is business. Don't nothing happen in this world unless somebody's getting paid. Walter, eat your eggs. That's it. Eat your eggs. Walter, that ain't none of our money. I get up, I go to a bathroom I gotta share with two floors of people. I look in the mirror, 35 years old, been married 11 years. I got a boy who sleeps in the living room. And all I gotta tell him is stories about how rich white people live. says it all, don't you? Morning, everybody. It says just what's wrong with women today. Don't know how to build your men up. Yeah. Make them feel like they can be somebody, like they can do something. You know, not all women are like that. Just like there's some men who actually do something. No thanks to their women. We'll start timing people. You should get up earlier. When you look at the whole production, the 2008 production, and, oh my, I can't imagine anybody ever, ever playing Lena as well as ever again as Felicia Rashad did Lena. Because um, here's my thing with with this play. It's it's the anger thing again. Um, the A lot of the productions I've seen, the anger comes so forcefully. Uh, and it's just sometimes it, it struck me as overkill um, for the scene they were doing. In that 2008 production, the anger was still there, but it was so much more subtly done that somehow it made it more powerful to me than just like, you know, ramming this anger down my face. Um, there are moments where Felicia Rashad does very little other than, you know, maybe take a breath in or raise her eyebrow a certain way or just turn her head towards the window a certain way and you read so much into it, which to me moves me so much more than just having somebody scream into a camera. Oh, you haven't even looked at it yet. That's it. You've decided. Decided that this is the way we're gonna live. Will you tell that to my boy tonight when you put him to sleep on that living room sofa? Will you tell that to my wife when she's slaving over somebody's dirty laundry? Will you tell it to yourself, mama, when you're fixing food in somebody's kitchen that your own family can't even afford to eat? Where are you going? I'm going out. I'll come with you. I don't want you to come. Walter, I gotta... I gotta talk to you about something. That's too bad. Walter, please. Sit down. I'm a grown man, Mama. Ain't nobody said you wasn't grown, but you're still in my house and my presence. And as long as you are, you will talk to your wife still alone. Now sit down. Let me go on. It makes me sick to my stomach. You turn mine too, baby. Walter, please. My biggest mistake. What is wrong with you? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Oh, yes, there is something wrong with you. You being eaten up like a crazy man. And there's something more to me not giving you this money. This ain't new. For the past two years, I've been watching you get all nervous acting, wild in the eyes. I gotta go out. I'm not finished talking to you. I don't need your nagging right now, Mama. So, what you gonna do? Go somewhere and drink? 
Seem like you always tied up in a knot about something, ready to bust out and yell anytime anybody say anything to you. People can't live like that, Walter. Ruth is a good and patient girl in her way, but you get to be too much, son. Oh, don't make the mistake of driving that girl away from you. What mistake? What she ever do for me? That girl loves you, Walter. Yeah, you do. Because if it's all right with you, I would like to go home, please. Son, I'm oh, sorry, son. I'm sorry about your liquor store, but that just ain't the thing for us to do. Gotta go. I hope Mama. Mama wants so many things. It's kind of driving me crazy. What is it that you want, baby? You, you, you got a nice wife, a fine boy. You got a job. A job? A job, Mama? Mama, I open and close car doors all day. I drive a man around that looks right through me. I say, yes, sir. No, sir. Shall I take the drive, sir? Am I the best trained monkey you ever seen, sir? Mama, that ain't no kind of job. That ain't nothing. Why do I even think you don't understand me? Understand what, baby? Sometimes when I'm driving that man around, and we passing them cool, fancy restaurants. And these white boys, these white boys, they've just been in there talking about things. Important things. They close a million dollar deals. I know they are. And mama, these white boys, they don't look much older than me. So once again, it's money. Yes, it's about money. Because money is life. Money is life? I remember a time when freedom used to be life. But now it's money? Have times changed that much? No, they haven't changed. It's always been about money. We were just never allowed to get close enough to see it. No, something has changed. In my time, if we could make it to the North without being lynched and still have a shred of dignity, too, that was enough. But now here come you and Benita, y'all talking about things that just go right past me. Now, you my children, but sometimes y'all might as well be strangers. You don't understand. You probably never will. And there were some scenes in the other productions where it started to feel like that a little bit, where they were just going crazy across the stage. The 2008 production is shot much more like an actual movie, even though the play, you know, obviously it's it's written to be done on a stage, so it's all like one room, basically, in this apartment building. Um, I don't know if I can't remember if there are any set changes in the actual production. I think it's just the apartment in the play. But uh, in the 2008 production, they expanded it a little bit. So you do see Walter at his job and you do see Benita at her school and they made it, you know, more like a, a film production. I don't mean to like skip over Danny Glover other than I just wasn't really feeling that performance. Um, out of all of them, Danny Glover not surprisingly, played Walter the angriest because Danny Glover plays a lot of his characters kind of on the angry side. Um, or at least agitated side. Um, but this was done when he was, was much younger and it's still, it's, it's just his, his tone and his movements and everything, they're a lot more aggressive than I read Walter as. And, uh, this disclaimer, <laughs> I'm just saying, this is all personal preference I'm talking about. Obviously, you know, there's going to be plenty of you out there that have a differing opinion. I'm just, it's my channel, my video, I'm just giving my side of things. Uh, so, yeah, that was my take. Um, I watched the Danny Glover one, but I just, I wasn't feeling it. Um, that one is probably the closest to, you know, completely stage production. Oh, I forgot. Um, I forgot. Uh, I made a note here. Um, I don't know if there are any clips of it online. I don't think I could find any, but uh, there was also a Broadway production. I can't remember the exact year where um, Denzel Washington played Walter and um, got a lot of acclaim for that role as well, which I'm sure it was amazing because it's, again, it's freaking Denzel. It's like when you talk about Sidney Forte, it's like, Denzel, of course he was amazing.
me and your daddy. But I thought I taught you something else, too. I thought I taught you to love him. Love him? There's nothing left to love. There's always something left to love. Have you cried for that boy today? Now, I don't mean for yourself and for the family because we lost the money. I mean for him and what he's gone through. And God help him. God help him what it's done to him. Child, when do you think is the time to love somebody the most? When he's done good and made things easy for everybody. <laughs> no, no. No, that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at his lowest. And he can't believe in himself because the world's done whipped him so. When you start measuring somebody, measure them right, child. Measure them right. You make sure that you done taken into account the hills and the valleys he's come through to get to wherever he is. I would definitely, if you've sort of like pushed off the idea of watching the Sean Combs production of this, I would definitely recommend it. And of course, watch the Sydney Portier one because that one is still great too. Um, watch both of them. Um, I don't know, Danny Glover one is up to you. I, my personal opinion is like, take it or leave it. But at least see the, the Portier and the Combs ones uh, if you want to get a good feel for this. <coughs> I don't know if there's any um, video recordings of the Denzel one since it's, since it was, since it was a Broadway play. Um, but if you know of any, let me know, because I, I would like to see a production of that. I just didn't have access to Broadway tickets <laughs> when that came out. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, Black History Month is starting to come to a close, but I did want to say that my videos for Black Authors um, obviously aren't going to come to a close. I have much more planned in the following months, so stay tuned and we'll talk more. But yeah, I think that's it. So thanks for hanging out and we will talk soon. Bye guys.